I'm Ned Kalange. I'm president and uh, CEO of the Colorado Trust, and I'm thrilled you're here with us for the Health Equity Learning Series today. I want to talk just a little bit uh, about the trust before I introduce the speakers. Our vision is that all Coloradans have fair and equal opportunities to lead healthy, productive lives regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live. The where we live is what is uh, bringing us to the topic and the speakers today as we talk about rural uh, challenges faced in the equity space. We have a long history at the Trust of partnering with both rural and urban communities, especially for vulnerable populations. And I'm excited to hear about working with rural communities in New Mexico. At your place, there are a number of materials I'd like to call your attention to. The first is an article from the Con Alma Health Foundation entitled A Roadmap for Health Equity, which provides an overview of the foundation's health equity focus in New Mexico and one we'll hear about today. There are fact sheets and infographics that have been provided by the Rural Health Center and the Colorado Coalition for the Medically Underserved. All these materials focus on key health equity issues facing rural Coloradans. And I would really like to uh, thank uh, both of those organizations for those materials. The last handout, of course, is the survey for feedback about today's event. And we take these very seriously. We were told that you wanted to hear about rural health equity. And so this is in direct response, and we're quite excited. So at the end of the meeting, if you could please uh, do us a favor and um, uh, fill out the survey that will help us uh, make this a better e series going forward. I'm hoping we're tested now. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank and welcome our virtual participants across the state. We are live streaming today, and thanks uh, Open Media for their assistance. There are literally hundreds of people online at the same time, and here are the communities who are hosting the viewing parties. I welcome all of you across the state. I want to recognize just a few uh, folks that are with us today. Um, uh, the first is uh, Dr. Janik Joshi, who's the state representative from Colorado Springs. Thanks for coming. And I'd also like to acknowledge my dear friend, uh, First Lady Jeannie Ritter. Thanks for coming. I was trying to decide whether the uh, politically correct approach is former First Lady. Um, and then I realized that you will always be my First Lady. <laughs> Following the presentation, we're engaged in a dialogue with the audience. For those of you watching this through streaming, Please submit questions via Twitter. Here's our uh, handle at Colorado Trust or hashtag Health Equities TCT. <clears throat> also, you can use email, sending your questions directly to health equity at coloradotrust.org. We have, uh, rep uh, we have uh, um, um, people standing by to take your questions and provide them. And we'll do our best to get as many uh, questions answered in the time we have as possible. So with all those little things taken care of, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Many of you know our first presenter today was supposed to be Dr. Dolores Roybal, who is the executive director of the Con Alma Health Foundation. But due to a family emergency, she was unable to join us today. She was gracious enough to ask her colleague, Denise Gonzalez, to take her place. And Denise was gracious enough to say, oh, sure. Uh, we had dinner with Denise uh, last night. I will tell you that uh, she is a very capable uh, presenter, and I've stopped thinking about her as a stand-in. So, um, she is the program director for ConAlma. ConAlma is a health equity funder with a focus on serving rural, tribal, and culturally diverse communities in New Mexico. Uh, Denise came to ConAlma in August of 2014, so she's not quite been there a year yet. Uh, but she's devoted her career to promoting social justice and good health through other nonprofits and philanthropy in New Mexico. Her previous role was Director of Community Philanthropy for the New Mexico Community Foundation. Our second speaker is Susan Wilger, the Director of Programs for the National Center for Frontier Communities. 
this organization serves as a central point of contact for referrals, information exchange, and networking among rural, geographically separated communities. Uh, and Susan also serves on the board of the National Rural Health Association and provides services for a community health center. So I'm excited to hear from Susan. So with nothing else to say, I'm going to turn things over to Denise and ask you all to welcome her. Thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to be visiting with you. I'm very honored to um, be here at the invitation of the Colorado Trust. Um, just, I'm here to present on um, health equity in rural communities, but before I start, I did want to get one thing off the table. Um, we have this debate, ongoing debate with Colorado about green chili. I just want to state that officially we are the chili capital and we do have the best green chili, okay? <laughs> so, um, many of you have probably seen this picture um, before or um, if it's new to some people, I'll just give you a second to look at it. Um, you see these three boys trying to look over at a ball game and there's some boxes. and. Um, the picture on the left really represents equality, and the picture on the right is really about equity. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm, this is the reverse of <laughs> how you're looking at it. Um, equality is about sameness, and it only works if everybody starts out from the same place. Equity is about fairness access to the same opportunities. And sometimes when we're thinking about equity, we have to shift resources or allocate more resources and that's what the boxes are showing. Sometimes you have to push a little bit more resources um, to get everybody to the same level. And really, we cannot enjoy equality unless we have equity. And so um, this is one of my favorite um, pictures that we, we use all the time to just sort of talk a little bit about what equity means versus equality. You'll see a lot of different descriptions of what health equity is. That's kind of the buzzword now in philanthropy and nonprofits. Um, Ned got up here and just talked a little bit about what it means to the Colorado Trust. Some of the definitions that we've used, um, one of my favorite is from Kamara Jones, just the assurance that, of that conditions for optimal health um, is health equity. Um, and so we, um, we look, it's funny, we just did a, um, a survey with some grant makers in New Mexico, and we asked them to talk about what equity means to them. And I'll tell you, we came up, there was 20 people who responded, and they were all completely different, but all had the same thing, um, or same roots about um, fairness and um, kind of pulling resources to make things um, equal for people. So um, we'll talk a little bit about what the differences are between health equity and health disparities. So a health disparity is a difference in health between groups of people. And um, this can be by racial or ethnic groups. They can be by socioeconomic groups, gender, age. Um, and they can be measured and described. There are some health disparities that are not inequitable. And one example I always um, show to people is that women live longer than men. That's kind of just the way it is. That's not, an <laughs> uh, to the men it may seem like it's inequitable, but it's the mortality rates just show that women live, live longer. Um, public health traditionally try to reduce health disparities by targeting interventions um, to individuals within vulnerable populations. And the difference is health equity is based on the belief that everybody should be entitled to a healthy life. Um, and most health disparities are avoidable and they're really the result of social 
or economic conditions, policies, um, pe where people grow up, um, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about how these disparities are really affecting rural um, New Mexico and Colorado. And so good health requires not only looking at health in a traditional way, but it also means that we're focusing attention on the systems and policies and environments that influence health. And so um, you'll hear a lot about um, people doing health in all policies, you know, and that is like working um, conditions, everything from working conditions to transportation, um, housing is really health can influence all policies if we want it to. So, um, this is a little quiz here. What do you think determines a person's health status? What do you think is the green area, the 55%? Very good, social determinants. See, you guys have seen all this before. <laughs> so social determinants and um, behavior are actually a large part of what determines a person's health status. It's where they live, where you work, where you play, that is really going to affect what your health is like. Um, and healthcare is really a very small portion of that, and genetics are even really smaller than that. When we talk about social determinants, we're talking about what I just said. <laughs> it's um, some of these determinants are shaped by historical decisions, economics, and social policies. One of the um, I always reference, uh, I did some work some years ago on um, bringing communities, uh, community voice around some of the national labs that the Department of Energy runs. And it's no, um, it's not a mistake that some of these national labs butted up against traditional communities or disenfranchised communities. And um, really some of the health effects that we saw were because of the, um, where they lived. So a lot of the downstream type stuff was happening, pollution, um, and these people had no um, control over the effects of, of what was happening. Um, economics, if there aren't jobs, if there aren't resources, that's definitely going to um, affect people. And people tend to um, gather with their um, own races, their ethnicities, and socio socioeconomic status. So that often really help, um, affects the social determinants. So what two factors best predict a community's health? This is a little quiz here. Anybody? It's your zip code and the color of your skin. That really is going to affect your status, your health status. When we look at the color of your skin and your zip code, we are looking at sort of poverty rates, race and ethnicity. And um, we look and we see that areas with high incidence of poverty often reflect low income pockets of racial and ethnic minorities. If you look at this, this came from the USDA um, and the cen they pulled it from the Census Bureau in 2013. But the poverty rate for non-metro Hispanics was 29%, um, but their um, non-metro population, so their rural um, areas, increased faster than other ethnic groups. Um, you can see that black and Hispanics, um, the black is almost twice as many um, poverty rates um, were, were, were higher in rural areas than they were in metro areas. When we look at the poverty and um, income in Colorado, the median household income in rural counties right now is about 26.5% less than the median household income um, in urban counties. So um, that's quite a lot if you think about it. And um, we see that almost 9% um, or 9.8% 9, 9 of families living in rural counties live below the federal, federal poverty level in Colorado. And 25, almost 25% 25 of the children who are residing in Colorado in rural counties, they live in poverty. In New Mexico, that's 
that we have. This is just a snapshot um, of New Mexico adults um, comparing urban and rural um, health statuses. And we see that um, people, the adults that lived in rural areas or in mixed urban rural areas reported poorer health than their um, contemporaries in metro areas. And another one, just looking at the ethnicities, is the Hispanics and people of color, Asians and blacks, definitely reported poorer health status than their white contemporaries. So right now, we're seeing a huge shift in demographics. We always talk about New Mexico as sort of being the model for the country. New, basically, the rest of the country is going to look a lot like New Mexico looks right now. Um, we have um, a majority of, our majority is minorities. We see this shift in Colorado from 1980 to 2010, um, people of color went from 17% to 30%, and by 2040, you all will have 42% of your population will be people of color. And by 2043, the United States, in, everybody in America will, look, will be, um, look a lot like Colorado and New Mexico, where the majority of the population is gonna be people of color. And why does that matter? Um, why does that matter to look at these, these, um, these statistics in people of color? Because people of color traditionally are um, disenfranchised. They have less opportunities than their white contemporaries. And um, we look at their well-being. It's really how their well-being is going to determine the success of this country and it's gonna determine the economic well-being of this country. So it makes sense to start helping people of color and help getting them and moving towards equity so that everybody can enjoy some of the same benefits. Um, I was at a presentation a couple weeks ago um, from an organization called um, Mission Readiness. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with that, but it's a bipartisan group of um, of military leaders who got together and started a non nonprofit, and um, they were looking at sort of what was happening in the nation, and they had some pretty profound statistics. 74% um, of the kids ages 17 to 24 are unfit right now in um, the United States to serve in the armed forces. And why? It was health. One of the major reasons was health. It was health and education and then incarceration. And a lot of it had to do with high numbers of incarceration with colored uh, people of color. Um, and that really spoke to me at this one convening um, because he was talking to a conservative group of people, but it really spoke about where our country is, is headed. And, it's really a national security issue if the people, if you don't even have enough people to sort of help out your, um, your country. I was gonna um, talk a little bit about what's happening nationally um, with the population in the United States. Um, about 25% of the United States right now is rural and 75% urban. Um, and when you look at like that ratio, when we talk about even physicians or um, social determinants, there's um, the percentage of U.S. physicians is only 10% in rural counties and 90% in urban counties. So that's a big that's a big shift right there. You have 25% of the population, but only 10% of the doctors working um, in rural areas. Uh, we look at the um, average um, per capita income. It's, it mirrors a little bit of what's happening in um, Colorado and New Mexico. Um, you look at the death rates. I mean, with males um, ages 1 through 24, you know, um, the differences between rural and urban is pretty, pretty significant. And then um, the um, pop population that is below poverty level two is very, very interesting. Next slide. 
This is a slide that um, Dolores put in here. Um, it came from the USDA again. They did some economic research um, using the 2013 census, and it just showed the population loss, and you can see that um, there was a lot of, like if you look at New Mexico and um, Colorado, if you're familiar with the layout, um, there's a lot more people moving to urban areas, um, the rural, but still large parts of the, of the, um, the counties are, or the states are, um, are definitely rural still. Next slide. So of the 64 counties um, in Colorado, 17 are urban and 24 are rural and 23 are what we consider frontier community, communities. And Susan's gonna talk a lot about the differences between what is rural and what is frontier. Um, it's interesting, but you guys have 77% um, of your land mass is considered rural. And, um, and when I thought this was really interesting, five of your counties have less than one person per square mile. It's pretty interesting. And um, by, age, by 2018, which is only three years away from now, um, the group that's projected to grow in rural counties is the 65 and over population. That has some pretty startling um, significance, and we're seeing the same thing happen in New Mexico, is um, our aging population is growing very quickly as younger people are leaving out of the state because to pursue other economic um, opportunities, and our older people are sort of being stuck in the rural areas. Next slide. We have um, seven counties in New Mexico that are urban out of our 33 counties. So most of our state is, is actually rural. And it's 40% um, of our land is actually owned by the federal and state government. That's, so what are some of the key disparities that we're seeing in rural areas? We see a lot of um, racial and ethnic minorities that are suffering um, higher rates of mortality and illnesses like um, obesity and they are receiving a lower um, quality of health care. In New Mexico right now we're having an issue where um, they have a lack of um, health care access because we can't attract enough doctors and nurses to be in rural areas. They come in um, they attract them at first, you know, because they, they take some money off of their student loans and they place them in these rural areas or in these tribal areas. And then after their stint is over, so to speak, you know, they're left there and they're thinking, well, I want to raise a family, there's not enough ep economic opportunities, or maybe the schools aren't that great. So you see a lot of physicians who are not really staying in the state, they're sort of moving on. Um, you see fewer physicians and dentists practicing in rural areas, and if people um, are already suffering with poverty, you know, they're less likely to be traveling to receive um, preventative health care if they're having to use money to get to different places. Next slide. We see a lot of um, risks in rural communities. Um, there are higher risks for um, dependencies on alcohol and um, drugs and tobacco. You see a lot of motor vehicle fat fatalities. Um, that's one thing that we uh, learned in New Mexico is that um, more people die um, of motor vehicle fatalities in rural areas than in urban areas. Um, and there's just a general higher mortality rate um, in rural areas. Next slide. So when we look at rural communities, um, before I got up here, I had one of um, your, um, somebody from the audience said, I'm so happy that you're here because you're gonna tell me all the solutions in dealing with rural <laughs> populations. And I thought, oh, wait, I don't know if I'm gonna do that. But I'm just gonna tell you what has worked for us. And that is looking at rural areas and looking at the culture, tradition, and community for existing strength and assets. Conalma really looks at communities for um, the answers to their own problems. Oftentimes, people need to be 
just talked to, understood, um, you know, engaged in a way where we can understand what is really happening in communities. We have all these statistics, we have all of these numbers that are thrown at us, like I just did a while ago, and, but we really don't know, like what does the community think? And what is really, what are their strengths? And um, it's interesting how many times communities can find their solution to their own, their own needs. Um, we find that the people in our state are very resilient, resourceful, and self-reliant, especially in rural areas. They know how to barter. They know, to ha they know how to survive. They know how to get by. Um, they, um, we have a very rich culture where we see that a lot of the community-based values are very family-oriented and intergenerational and um, cultural. And then, Innovative, rural communities are very natural and expert innovators. They can really come up with solutions to sort of help themselves and get moving. And sometimes it just need, they just need a little bit more resources um, to help themselves get back on track or to, or to do things. Next, next slide. So Konamo's mission has always been to just kind of respond to the health rights and needs of the culturally and demographically diverse people in New Mexico. We really um, advocate for, all, for health policies that address um, the health needs of all, especially people um, in rural areas and um, people of color. So um, we... Conamla is more than just a grant maker or a foundation um, that does grant making. We really um, are a convener and we are really experts at sort of leveraging resources and helping other partners. Um, we do a lot of um, um, partnerships around the state where we help each other um, build um, coalitions and communities. Um, to engage people in some of the policy issues that are um, affecting them. We um, try to be the catalyst for systems change, positive systems change, and we um, really define health broadly. So we talked a l I talked a little bit about health and all policies, and we really believe in that, that um, health policies can be um, pretty much measured into almost anything that people do. Um, their work, workplaces, um, where they play, um, anything that affects them, they can, health policies can be implemented. Next slide. And so um, when we look, our work is really um, kind of, we do a lot more upstream or what we call um, systems change work. We um, kind of don't focus so much on direct services, but we tend to do things where we're looking at whole systems of things. Next slide. This is a um, this is a very confusing slide, and um, I don't like this slide too much. But this is um, a framework for health equity, and it just kind of shows sort of what upstream um, health equity looks like versus downstream. And downstream, you see, is it's like very um, you know risk behaviors, diseases, injuries, sort of direct services. And then upstream is really looking at social inequalities and institutional powers and neighborhood conditions. So it's looking more at systems that are guiding individuals, systems that are guiding um, downstream. Next slide. So um, back in 2012, we did a health equity um, report. It was called a Roadmap for Grant Making and Beyond. And um, we looked at some, we looked and found some key findings that um, we can really advance health equity and improve health if we address policies that um, affect the social determinants of health. We realized that um, people needed access to quality, affordable health care, and that continues to be a barrier to good health. Um, New Mexico's made great strides with the ACA, and I know that um, Colorado has made huge strides with the ACA, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, prevention, nutrition, health promotion, um, and holistic health are really critical to improving health. And um, 
the rapidly changing demographics and environment um, is definitely going to have major implications in health locally and throughout the United States. And so some of the recommendations that we came from looking at this study was really to invest in communities and have true community collaboration, have the projects come from the communities, have them empower them to find their own solutions, um, and really to invest in health and invest in systems and start leveraging resources. So Conalma um, traditionally in some ways um, may not give a lot of money in grants, but we leverage resources. So we'll, we'll fund something that might help an organization to get even more and more money. Or um, we do things where we partner up with people to attract more money into the state. Next slide. Um, so with the changing environment, um, it, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of opportunities. You're gonna see this here in Colorado too. Um, there's the changing demographics that we talked about, the economic environment. Um, a lot of people think we're out of the slump, economic slump, um, but that has not really trickled down to affect a lot of rural areas um, and a lot of just um, people of color. Um, healthcare and health reform, you know, uh, we just had the, you know, King versus Burwell ruling, which has affected all of us, but um, we're still, there's still a lot of work to be done on um, health care and health reform. And then changes that are affecting governmental business and nonprofit sectors. We're seeing a lot more nonprofits that are tighter, um, experiencing some economic um, constraints and a lot more tighter budgets. And um, <clears throat> next, next slide. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the um, projects that we're doing right now. It was called Healthy People, Healthy Places. And um, this is a good example of sort of a community coming up with a solution to a problem that they had. We, um, it was a three-year um, national and state funders um, collaborative, and we focused on um, rural, low-income communities of color and we were trying to increase um, equitable built environment and equitable access to healthy foods. And so we worked with one of the Pueblos um, in New Mexico, the Zuni tribe, and um, they had traditionally been an agriculture-based um, Pueblo where they, they did the three, what we call the three sisters, the squash beans and um, corn and they sort of were losing it. They were seeing that um, the newer generations were not as interested in working in agriculture. They didn't understand the significance of the corn in their um, beliefs and in their culture and their values. We gave a little bit of money to um, a project where they built a um, school garden and they had parents and um, children eight to 10 who were working on the school garden. And before you knew it, they had more people from the community who were just coming and checking out the garden. They wanted to eat some of the vegetables. They were really excited. Some of the older people came in and were trying to, you know, explain, well, you know, this is why we grew corn. This is why corn was um, important to our culture. And pretty soon the council, the tribal council got involved and they wanted to partake of the, of the, um, this little plot of land, but they realized it wasn't gonna be enough land to support the, the whole tribe. So the tribal council met and they decided to donate a large tract of land um, to the community. And so they invited multi-generational um, group of people to come and start working on it. And before you knew it, it's become a community garden for sure. But the remarkable thing about that was it started they started seeing this culture, they started seeing people more eating healthier, really enjoying the benefits of the healthy food. And then they started thinking about, well, we're eating healthy food, but what about exercise? And so they used a little bit of money that we had given them to leverage, and they actually got a grant to build a soccer field next to the um, community garden. So um, that was just one really good example, I thought, of where a community just came together and started thinking about ways that they can involve other people and make a difference in their community. 
Um, we, um, a lot of the, uh, the projects that we did focused on policy. We had, um, and I think Susan will talk a little bit about some of the food policies, but um, we, one of the other examples of, um, that came out of this project was the double up bucks for SNAP. So um, people can go to most of the farmer's markets in New Mexico, we still need to get a few more on board, where they can use their SNAP vouchers um, and they'll have double the bucks if they use it for vegetables and fresh foods. Next slide. Um, there's a couple of other um, interesting examples that just talk a little bit about like, you know, looking at health broadly. We, um, New Mexico has some of the highest water quality standards and we had an organization who brought it to our attention that these um, water quality standards may have had a real chance of being lowered. There was a large, large um, lobbying groups who were trying to get the standards lowered um, for businesses and agriculture. And um, so one of the, and they would affect a lot of the indigenous communities who lived along the Rio Grande and who lived along the tributaries. So um, one of the, um, the projects that we did was funding this organization, Amigos Bravos, to really start looking at who was wanting to change these standards and what the health effects of changing these standards would do. And it was gonna be a ripple effect where it was gonna really affect you know, biologically and ecologically what was happening in these rivers and then trickle, um, you know, people eat the fish, they swim in the water, they drink the water, they use it to irrigate their lands. And so um, we actually, um, there it's still being debated, but we're, we're pretty, um, I think we're pretty confident that they'll keep the water standards at where they are. Um, we also worked with the Community Health Workers Association to recruit and train and mentor community health workers to um, assist in the certification of the 2014 Community Health Workers Act in New Mexico. So trying to get them to come more organized and collaborative and train them on um, um, different um, aspects of helping their communities. Next slide. So um, some examples I mentioned is that we work a lot with other um, funders. We work with a lot of other foundations to really leverage resources. And so we've, um, we've been successful. We've partnered up with Grant Makers in Health and brought in over $34 million to New Mexico to plan the health exchange. Um, right now we're doing an ACA assessment, very similar to what the Colorado Trust did, where we're looking at the ACA and examining how it's affecting our populations. If some of the policies are being implemented, um, some of the ways that um, the ACA is affecting families, not just low income, but um, looking at how it's affecting middle income families um, and how it's affecting the providers. So um, we'll have that report on in early June, January of next year. And then we also did a health um, blueprint for health even before the ACA was kicked off to kind of look and see um, what the issues were in New Mexico. Next slide. So um, there's a lot of opportunities um, to collect and share data and resources in rural communities. Um, you know, you can look at policy and research census, um, funding, best practices, um, foundation reports, collaborations, um, encourage people to share information. Um, we, not one organization and not one foundation and not one group is gonna make a difference. It's gonna mean that people are gonna have to collaborate, put aside egos, and really come together and start working together um, and, and not work in silos. Um, we listed some of the re resources that we thought of um, and there's many other ones. One that I don't see here but um, that I always look at is, I don't know if any of you guys know what Policy Link is, but they have some fantab I mean, fantastic, fantastic um, resources on their website. Um, and so, oh, she does have it here, National Equity Atlas, so policy link. So, um, 
Anyway, that's the end of my presentation. I apologize for all the, um, <laughs> the slide mix up, but uh, I just want to introduce um, Susan Wilger. She's with the National Center for Frontier Communities and one of our partners. Thank you, Denise, and I'd like to thank the Colorado Trust. It's always an opportunity, it's always a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk about rural and frontier. For the past 15 years, I've been living in, I was living in southwestern New Mexico. I lived about 25 miles outside, it was east of a small little town of 10,000. I moved there from Austin, Texas, so it was a, quite a culture shock. But living in rural um, America is also a very wonderful and fulfilling experience. And so having the opportunity to talk about both rural and frontier is um, always wonderful. So who, who's controlling slides? Oh, next slide, okay. I don't know, I don't have a clicker. Um, here again in Colorado, uh, you have 64, is it 60, um, 64, yeah. Uh, so 75 percent of your state is rural, but it only represents about 16 percent of the population. One thing when we're talking about rural, you're, when a lot of decisions are based around economic power and voting power. And so you're automatically at a, at a disadvantage when you're in rural because you don't have that um, political power through votes and you don't have the economic power through a lot of businesses that you find in urban areas. Next slide. So what do we, what do we mean when we talk about rural or frontier? And those of you that work in rural and frontier, you may be aware that there's no one definition. There's multiple definitions. Oftentimes, definitions are set by policy, either state policy or federal policy. One of the things that we do at the National Center for Frontier Communities is we actually track and monitor those definitions. Whenever you define a rural area, what is rural or, or what is urban or what is frontier, you have winners and losers. Um, and what you, you also have are policy and program and funding implications. And so it's real important for us to track that. Here are uh, three examples of what you typically find within a definition. One is distance. You're, you're measuring the distance when you're thinking about rural and frontier, you're looking at the distance to a major service center. And when we talk about services, we're talking about basic services. So how, how far are you to receive um, basic health care, like a hospital? Hospitals are pretty common. In, um, we talked a lot about food. Another basic need is around food. So how far is it to the nearest grocery store? So that's one um, aspect of a definition. The other is travel time. And those of us that live in rural know that you may be 25 miles from the closest city, but you may have to go through a winding mountain road to get there. So it may take you an hour to travel 25 miles. And in the winters here in Colorado, which can be pretty severe, um, you know that's very common. So not only distance, but time is very important. The third one, population density, is probably the most common way that people think about um, rural and frontier. Typically, it's around um, six or fewer people per square mile is what you thought, but that's not um, always the case depending on the definition. We have HRSA that have, you know, HRSA uses um, definitions of rural and frontier both for policy and, and funding. We have um, CMS has various definitions. We have USDA has various definitions. And your state probably has various definitions. When we uh, think about population density, what, what, what would you guess is the population density of Denver County? Any guesses? Come on, someone take a guess. Give me a number. What? 470? 3,922 people per square mile. 
in Denver County. How much would you guess is in Dolores County, people per square mile? Uh, she's right, two. Two people per square mile. So that's the difference when you're talking about that power, about that voice. So next slide. So why think about urban versus rural versus, versus frontier? Um, one is that we know geographic areas, each, every one is, every place is unique. And so you're gonna need different interventions for meeting those needs of those communities. And so uh, we also wanna make sure that there's geographic equity. You don't wanna make sure you're putting all your resources in one spot, and, it, and it's not very equitable to make sure to put um, resources in the places where you have concentrated populations. So you wanna make sure that you had that geographic representation, and you also wanna make sure that you establish capacity for access to those basic key services. One thing about being in rural and frontier, we know that we, and we don't expect to have all services available in the areas that we leave. We're not gonna have malls, we're not gonna have full uh, hospitals in very, very small populated areas, but at least have access to very basic services, access to food, access to emergency care. So, um, you also have to have the capacity to, to make that happen when there is inequitable, um, when, when there's uh, disparities or inequities. For example, um, Denise had mentioned earlier about workforce development, and I think this is a really good example, and people are, are pretty familiar with some of the actions that have taken to bring more equity to rural and frontier areas because we have such um, shortages in those areas. And so we know that we have loan repayment programs to, to give an incentive for people to work in those areas. We also um, build capacity by um, having uh, access to technology because you're, we're seeing a real strong movement around telehealth. And that gives the capacity of those rural and frontier areas to be able to connect with a psychiatrist or, or with um, other specialists that we know we're not going to have in our rural and frontier areas. Next slide. So working in partnership, it's really, really important to work in partnership. Um, I think especially in rural and frontier areas, one of the assets that we have, I think one of the advantages that we have is we're, we tend to be very collaborative because we're used to having um, fewer resources oftentimes that is available in urban uh, communities and so we try and make the best of what we have. And I find in, in working in, in rural and frontier communities that there is a lot of collaboration that takes place. And we also have that collaboration with our funders, one of those wonderful funders being the Colnalma Foundation. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about those partnerships if you want to go on to the next slide. Uh, so, a little bit more about the National Center for Frontier Communities. You can see our vision statement. Our mission statement is to provide national leadership and build collaborations on issues important to frontier communities. And we, um, we are an uh, independent nonprofit organization. We've been around since 1997. We are a national focus, so we, um, even though we're based in New, New Mexico, we've, we've actually had our headquarters in New Mexico since 1997. Next slide. Uh, we're a small organization. We have limited staff, and so in working with the board in terms of how can we bring a voice to Frontier with the limited uh, staffing and and somewhat limited resources that we have, we decided to focus in on two primary areas. One is around capacity building for rural and frontier communities, and the other is around food, um, frontier food security, because we know uh, getting, having food access in frontiers is a different challenge than it is in urban areas. Uh, one of our major projects, which uh, we, we have had support through the uh, Colnoma Foundation for both of these projects. One of our projects is called the Nonprofit Resource, or the, yeah, the Nonprofit 
resource group, and that focuses on providing uh, capacity building to nonprofit organizations and community coalitions in frontier and rural areas. Um, the other project, and I'm going to talk more about that today because we deal a lot with equity issues, is our Southwest New Mexico Food Policy Council. So if you want to go to the next slide. So the reason why we formed a food policy council, and we are a recipient of the health, Healthy People, Healthy Places through, the, through Conelma Health Foundation. We had concern within our region around food, and there were they started there started to be some food movements and food advocates in four counties in the southwestern part of the state. Geographically, it's it's huge counties. It's it's larger than the size of Rhode Island and Maryland combined. Um, but uh, the county populations will range from 2,500 people in one of our largest counties. And, and of the region, the largest county is Grant County with 29,000 people in the full county. As, the food, as interest in food um, began to grow, we realized, gosh, we can only do so much at our county levels and our voice is so small. What, did, what would it look like if we joined together and, and started to collaborate as a region? And, so, and we see that a lot when you're dealing with rural and frontier, because your voice is so small, when, you know, because you're, you don't have much population and resources that oftentimes, in, and I'm seeing more where having that regional collaboration is really important. So in this case, we decided we, were, we did want to form together as a regional coalition, and we approached Conalma, for some funding to help us form the Regional Food Policy Council to address um, food equity and food justice issues. And so we got a small grant, it was a modest grant, $12,000, to help us um, form the coalition. And why is this important? One is, um, when you're talking about food equity and food justice, I, I like this um, definition as well regarding equity. It's like fair distributions of both the burdens and the benefits of the food system. And that's what we, we are trying to do in our food justice work. And when we're talking about burdens and benefits, we look at burdens and benefits and how food influences health, how it influences the environment, how it influences the economy and social well-being. Next slide. So food injustices. So in rural and frontier, we were really concerned around food injustices around these four areas. And these areas um, were also recognized by the World Health Organizations. And it really fit in with where we were going. So we have food insecurity. Uh, oftentimes this is measured and reflected by poverty rates and by food insecurity rates. And there's a lot of statistics out there. There's a lot of national data in terms of what food insecure counties are and of course your poverty rates. In our region, that our four county region that we're working with at the Regional Food Policy Council, one of those counties is Luna County. It's the second, it has the second highest rate of food insecurity in the entire nation. Behind, it's behind Yuma, Arizona. Luna County is also designated as a persistent poverty county. And what that means is that 20% or more of your population has been below the poverty level for 30 or more years. Persistent poverty is, is huge. But we also know that of persistent poverty counties nationwide, 85% are in rural areas. And nearly two thirds or 63% have the highest rates of food insecurity in the country. And this is why food is so important to us. We, um, as part of our, our, our um, once the coalition got formed and we've been um, leveraging resources, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we started collecting primary data and we surveyed um, 538 people who get their food through food pantries. And of those, 77% of the respondents said they rely on food from food pantries as a major food source. And 37% 
have used um, food pantries for over one year. So our food system, those food assistance, um, they were set up to be emergency food systems. They haven't been emergency folks for quite a long time. It's been about two decades where the people accessing food through our public food assistance programs, they're relying on those food for food sources. And we're also, and so that's happening nationally, and, and also what's happening nationally, we're seeing more and more seniors having to rely on food assistance programs for their food sources. In our survey, we found that 37% of those 538 people surveyed were age 65 and over, and so this is just reflective of a, of a national trend that's going on. So, um, oh, the other, um, go, no, go say this, go back, okay. <laughs> so five minutes, okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, so our health, health disparities, we know that um, in our region, like uh, we, we do have those health equity issues, we're seeing higher rates of obesity, diabetes, chronic heart disease, depression. The other um, health-related, nutrition-related health impact is asthma. Depression and asthma, I didn't realize how tied they are to health, and we found that through our literature search. Uh, food access, we had um, access to food quality and quantity, which we're looking at. Um, the other thing is the travel to food. In rural areas uh, among our food pantry recipients, 15% have to travel 25 or more miles one way just to access food. Two of our counties that we work with in our region only have one full service um, grocery store. In one of those counties, they have absolutely no WIC um, recipients that take uh, WIC vouchers in those counties. So, um, and then with workers' rights, you know, once again, looking at, in, in New Mexico, the workers that harvest the food are, um, are exempt from minimum wage. And the other thing is our farmers. We're trying to grow growers. We're trying to get food security within the region and promoting farmers, but they cannot make a living. You know, we have to change policies in order to give some of those subsidies and some of those advantages that our large farmers have to our small local um, family farms. Next, next slide. So working in partnerships. So we, like I mentioned, we're one of the um, healthy, healthy kids. <laughs> healthy people, healthy places, uh, recipients. And um, so we were funded in 2014 to, to establish our Food Policy Council. And this has been really, um, we had talked about at, at dinner last night and early about institutionalizing some of these um, these uh, collaborations. And so what we did it with our Regional Food Policy Council, we got representatives from all four counties. And right away, we began to develop some structures. So we have bylaws. A lot, in rural counties, you may, a lot of folks, they say, no, we don't, they don't, they hate that formality. But there's a way to work it will say, well, how do we want to make decisions? Or, you know, what are the expectations? And you have that discussion, and you begin to write it down, and you add a little, little bit more structure, and then, then you have bylaws. And so that's what we did. We created bylaws. We have multi-sector membership. Um, policy priorities, we started out with 45 potential policy areas in eight core areas with our policy council. And we began to narrow it, narrow it, narrow it, and we ended up with three primary um, goals that we're working on for the next few years. Uh, we were able to um, diversify our funding just with that $12,000 we had to really start our council, get our focus, have our bylaws. Once we had our focus of our priorities, we said, okay, here's what, we, here's, um, what our goal is, here's how we plan to do it. That leveraged where we were able to bring in um, over $100,000 in new funding to help us foca focus in those three areas. The other um, area in terms of strengthening capacity is increasing our membership capacity because if, if the, our funding ends, you know, we want to make sure that we're building that local um, capacity. So we now have, uh, through our data, and we have it cloud-based, so our, 
our partners that we're working with in the council, they now have access to all kinds of food data. So if they want to provide, um, apply for their own funding, they now through cloud storage can just access this data. Uh, we, t uh, we also um, were able to bring in some GIS mapping skills, so that was through our Department of Health, and they were able to go down locally and show folks how you can begin to um, create maps, which uh, paints a picture of your data. Um, and we're also doing strategic communication skills as well as um, teaching them on evaluation methods and analysis. So next slide. Uh, I talked a little bit about how we've leveraged resources. So in addition to leveraging the funding, we've also been able to leverage our partnerships and our coalitions and our collaboration, I should say. So we work really closely as part of our evaluation team. We have, um, uh, this is also out of the D Department of Health, the New Mexico Community Data Collaborative. We work with our county extension offices, which is extremely important when you're dealing with food policy. We have um, a really strong farm to table organization. We work really closely and their really key partners are our health councils, our Department of Health, health promotion teams, and our universities. And then, um, oh, I, I really want to touch on this because in dealing with rural and frontier, we get, um, it's really challenging to engage your, your local constituents, especially those that are impacted most by the policy that you're trying to change. And so what we have done is we've really reached out and worked very closely with our food pantry coordinators and then we go on site during distribution days, and so we've really tr um, working to engage also the food pantry food recipients. We're inviting them to our council. We've gone out there, we've done surveys, we've got to know them. We've also followed those surveys up with one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, people are, are now be really interested in, be in wanting to get more engaged in what we're doing around the food work in our, our area. We also work really closely with other food advocates. I mentioned, you know, through the Department of Health, Health Promotion, elected officials. In fact, our local senator has been really instrumental in helping us to get data, helping us connect to um, some of our state agencies that, that handle food policy. Um, and then last but not least, I think I'm close to the last slide and I know I'm running out of time, is um, promoting systems change. So we're, we've been working through our work at our regional level, we've been able to influence policies at multiple levels. Um, we're working on an agency rule change. That's one of the focus of the works that we're doing in our area. It's the emergency food program through the USDA. Every state has it. And um, what, what we found out is each state has discretion in how that food is distributed among their states. And we're rec making recommendations how we feel that can be more equitable. We're working at our, the, um, we hope to make recommendations to get uh, regional food banks to implement nutritional policies. Definitely at the local food pantry, they're looking at implementing food standards for food donations because the food quality is, is a real issue. And then um, we are also looking at, you know, how, um, what actions rural and frontier communities can do to fill that gap between supply and demand. And that's it. Thank you. So I'd like to open uh, it up for questions. And if you hold up your hand, a microphone will somehow magically appear in your hand. And right here, thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Kimberly Jackson. I work with the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. I've just started a project to try to make clinics, medical clinics across the state of Colorado more accessible. And I know in rural communities, accessibility and access for people with disabilities can be a huge problem because of transportation issues. I'm wondering what experience you've had with that and if you have any comments. Thank you. It'll come up. Okay. I, 
can um, give you one example. We um, we have a community that uh, was ex that is pretty far from like the veterans hospital, um, and they came to um, a couple of funders and said, you know, um, the state's not helping us with um, transportation to take these veterans to the veterans hospital, and. You know, a lot of these veterans were having a lot of health issues. They weren't getting the required assistance that they needed. And um, it just, you know, just watching it for about a year or two, it just was, you know, everybody was like, you know, that's your problem, that's your problem, or, um, you know, the families need to just figure it out. And um, they went to, um, they brought it up at a city council and they just said, hey, you know, this is like, this is a serious thing. And um, they started a program where they got some assistance um, and actually got some volunteers who would help drive um, the veterans to the hospital. And um, there was an issue about, you know, uh, well, we can't hire people, but they just went out into the community and said, you know, who's interested in even volunteering to help these veterans? And they were really surprised. They had a lot of people who responded and said, hey, you know, I'd like to volunteer my time. And so they were able to um, get some grant money for the gas and to um, bring the vans up to standards and then also train the driver, volunteer drivers. But that was one really unique way that um, a community got together and just were able to help some disabled um, people get, get to the services that they needed. That's one, um, one good example that I have. And, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. In working with frontier communities across the nation, transportation is one of the largest barriers. I was at a, a frontier innovators group in, in Montana last week, and in fact, some folks from Colorado were, were there, and they also brought up the struggles they've had historically around transportation. I don't think we can rely entirely on volunteers in our local communities to get people to to uh, fundamental services, and so we have to develop systems where we can make transportation more accessible and affordable. We used to have care management, which would pay for um, community organizations to transport um, patients, and in, in New Mexico, they cut that out of our fee service, and so we need to get that reinstated. The other thing that we're finding out is, um, is to expect people in rural and frontier areas to try somehow to access public transportation, which doesn't really exist, and if it does exist, you're going to probably take eight hours for a one-hour appointment. That's not workable. It's got to be door-to-door. -door. It has to be a door-to-door -door service, and so um, we're also exploring that. We don't have an easy solution. We're certainly monitoring that national, nationally to see if there are really good um, solutions, our own little brainstorming is where we know how popular Uber is, and so we would like to do a Uber system for, for rural areas, and so I'll, I'll keep you posted to see if we make any progress on that. So for those uh, who are listening far, the question was, what about language access and health equity in rural areas? Uh, that's a huge issue um, in New Mexico, and uh, we are seeing, you know, with the immigrant population, Hispanic population, that that is really um, affecting services, affecting um, sort of the um, transparency even of services. And um, now with the ACA, um, we just had this meeting in April where we brought people together to talk about some of the barriers, and language was one of the biggest barriers. There just isn't enough resources to help people understand um, even what the ACA was, um, and uh, sort of kind of relying on people knowing how to use technology. Um, New Mexico has 22 sovereign nations, and they all speak different dialects of um, you know, Native American language, and we're seeing that as a barrier. So we, um, there's different solutions that have come out of that. Uh, with the ACA in particular, we have used a lot of community health workers and have really um, 
just basically used community representatives. So we've trained community representatives in each of those populations where we thought there would have there would be some challenges, and have them talk to their neighbors and and help um, help bring resources and help them get you know signed up for the ACA. And um, we saw we just finished our. Um, closed our, our grant opening, we had our grant cycle open, and I was really surprised, I would say about 25% of the grant applications that we saw were to bring like translators or um, to, you know, reproduce things in Spanish or to um, address sort of um, make things, you know, uh, read a bit, you know, bring things more at a reading level that was um, that we see in the general population in New Mexico. I have a question. Um, I've, hello. Hi. I've heard uh, uh, about some real innovative telemedicine um, activities that are happening in New Mexico. Wondering how you're connected to those and utilizing those. And of course, uh, Jeannie, I would I have to ask how how is the mental health side of uh, telemedicine, or how, how are you addressing the mental health needs out in frontier New Mexico, yeah. if at all? Yeah, I'll, say, um, I'll, I'll start off with that. We're affiliated with a community health center in southwestern New Mexico. We've actually used telehealth very successfully. We have, um, we're, some of you may be familiar with Project ECHO, which I believe originated in New Mexico. We use um, telehealth for multiple areas. We use it for um, diagnosis and treatment. So if we don't have access, especially to like a child psychiatrists or other specialists, where the patient actually comes to the clinic, we, ha we have 11 clinics within two, two of our southern counties. The patient will go to the clinic and then they're, they're hooked up um, with telemedicine most of the providers are based in Albuquerque through the University of New Mexico. So it's for um, diagnosis, treatment with that patient, and the patients are actually responding really uh, positively to that. We've also had telemedicine between main clinics and then other clinics. So we, when we had our psychiatrist on staff, he could see you know, maybe, you know, multiple patients per day, but if he had to travel, uh, an hour one way down to another county that would just cut out his um, ability to see patients. And so he, he would actually, we would use telehealth between up, um, between, it, it, amongst our clinics as well. And then we also use it for professional development training among our providers. We also use it for peer learning among our providers and also with our community health workers. So the question for those watching from afar was about cultural barriers, especially for behavioral health services for families and children and adolescents. I, um, I, you know, New Mexico, I don't know if everybody knows what's happening in New Mexico, but um, our behavioral health has just been completely upheaved. And so I think that's what people are referring to a little bit or, or know about that. Um, I haven't seen I personally have not heard of any the cultural barriers. It is um, interesting. I see it more with the um, the um, generational barriers. You know, the older people. It's kind of interesting. I went with my grandfather, um, where they were using something similar to telehealth, and he was like, "How does that doctor see me?" You know, I had to explain. Like, you know, the camera is right there, and they're looking at. You know, he. It's a camera. But um, that, I've, I've heard more about the generational barriers, not so much about cultural barriers. And I've been involved in New Mexico behavioral health system for, um, for, for about 15 years. One of the largest cultural barriers I see is with um, the providers, because we don't have enough um, providers that reflect the populations, especially Hispanic populations, sp Spanish speaking, we have a severe shortage of bilingual providers, especially behavioral health providers. And so um, that's one of the big issues I see, both um, that culturally in terms of language, I know we're working really hard on our pipeline programs, we believe 
and grow your own. And so we're really trying at an early age, we start at middle school and high school, to introduce students to the health professionals, the fact that they could either pursue anything from a short-term certificate all the way up to um, an MD, and nurturing that relationship with them and their parents from middle school to high school, undergraduate, graduate, residency programs. We actually have um, about an average of 70 different interns and residents go through our clinics in rural New Mexico, so we're really trying to wrap replicate that system statewide so that we do have more um, culturally um, appropriate people who remained in, in the rural and frontier communities. Julian, do you have a question from Greater Colorado? Yes, we have a question uh, sent in online. Have you had any success collaborating with rural schools to implement health programs for children, and are there any best approaches you can share? I'll start off. Um, new in New Mexico, we have one of the strongest school-based health centers. We have about um, 70 school-based health centers, and I believe you also have school-based health centers in Colorado. I'm a real propo proponent of school-based health centers, and oftentimes the host organization in the school clinics, which are often uh, located right on the middle school or high school campus, um, the sponsoring organization, oftentimes our community health centers, they could be other entities, of course. But obviously, the beauty of school-based health centers is to allow very easy access for um, school-age children to access their health care. Oftentimes, they're integrated, so you have both the primary health care and the behavioral health care through the school-based health centers, which reduces any kind of stigma. And you're also... Um, identifying uh, any type of um, issues early, early on. So um, certainly I think there's been a lot of successes in school-based health centers. I would be remiss if I didn't um, ask this, and clearly I'm not as familiar with the funding environment in New Mexico as I am here in Colorado. Um, but I'm curious, I'm not sure if this is a question or more of a, a statement, um, relative to, and you know, you, you talked about the idea of, you know, healthcare just being, you know, part of the larger equation in terms of uh, achieving health equity and, and, and whatnot. Um, so within that context, currently, an increased um, focus on social determinants of health and health equity, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around a little bit um, the, the safety net clinic provider world and because um, I represent a, a certain niche here in Colorado of our, our safety net healthcare providers um, who are all, you know, living through the evolving ha uh, landscape of healthcare relative to ACA and, and whatever and, you know, health equity and, and this um, newer, I guess, focus on on social determinants of, of health, et cetera, um, but at the same time still trying to stay alive, um, maintain that access to care element that is still so important and, and struggling with that. So I'm just curious if you have any insights about how your providers in uh, New Mexico reacted to that. I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, not funding so much direct care, but more the systemic change and all that. I get that. But, and did mention, you know, the, the strained budgets of, of nonprofits. And much of this resonates, I think, with what's going on here in Colorado. Um, this feels familiar and, and sounds very familiar relative to what we've got going on. Um, but you know, we have a lot of safety net providers that are continuing to provide care to many folks in need, many that are not part of the ACA, working on a lot of those social determinants of health issues, et cetera, working towards ultimately health equity, but are, you know, constantly on a day-to-day -day basis trying to keep their doors open <laughs> and, you know, have those providers and, you know, and uh, the bulk of them obviously being nonprofit. So is that a question? Did I actually ask a question? <laughs> But I throw it out there <laughs> for folks, and I have some clinics in the room today that I know um, this is something that's yeah. you know top of mind always. That that definitely is a big concern in New Mexico right now. We're seeing um, just in one of one of our poorest um, counties where um, 
the majority of the residents are people of color. They just closed three, ca uh, three of the health clinics just closed because they couldn't keep their doors open. Um, and so we're very concerned about that. Um, with our ACA project, we are looking at the provider standpoint and how that's influencing or impacting um, because it's funny when you talk to residents about the ACA and how it's benefiting of people are saying, well, I can't even get in to see the doctor, so what, why am I have to pay this insurance? Or, you know, well, it's, how is it benefiting me if I can't even see a provider? So um, we, do, we are seeing that in New Mexico. We already have a shortage of health providers in New Mexico, and we know that that will continue to be a, an issue in the coming years. Um, what do we do about it? I don't know. Um, you know, we're we we're struggling with that. We're looking at different ways. Um, you know, working with um, you know the uh, Susan has many hats, but <laughs> working with another part, another um, organization that she works with in trying to impact community health workers. Um, and people are being very um, innovative. We had a, a proposal or a project that was brought to us where they're trying to train um, the EMTs um, because they see a lot of downtime with EMTs. They're in these you know, fire stations usually. They're there for 24 hours. They're kind of just hanging out until um, something happens, uh, urgent, and they have to be. But they're looking at maybe training EMTs to be community health workers and fill that gap. So people are trying to find some innovative ways to sort of, you know, um, to, to to look at how they can they can do prevention things or community things. We also use um, prometoras, which I'm, I'm sure everybody here is, is knows what that is. But you know, community is training community health workers. We just had um, this year the um, sounds really weird, but the um, what is it called? The it's the I always forget what it is. It's the people who print the money. Um, the Treasury Department, who was coming out and looking at ways of impacting the community health workers, they were actually interested, came to New Mexico, and were working with us um, on this because they're interested, they see the economic val value of that. Um, sometimes the lowest um, paid wages are to community health workers, but yet they're doing some of the you know, most important work and how do we uh, make that equitable and raise wages and stuff. So there's different ways that um, New Mexico is dealing with it, but you know, maybe that's a project that New Mexico and Colorado can work, work together on. <laughs> that's going to be, uh, have to be our last question. Uh, just another opportunity to thank our guest speakers today, Susan and Denise. We'll post the slides uh, from today's presentation on the website, and uh, we'll produce a video recording of the event, and it'll be available also on the website in the next couple of weeks. I hope you sign up to the website to, re to hear about information on upcoming Health Equity Learning Series events. I would ask you now to mark your calendars for September 17th, when we'll have John Powell speaking to us from the Haas Institute for a fair and inclusive society. We're very excited about uh, Professor Powell coming. Um, I want uh, you to know that History Colorado has generously agreed to allow all attendees to visit the uh, museum today. The uh, Ch uh, Chicano movement uh, display is up on the, I think, third floor. Uh, it's come back. I would encourage you to look at an uh, important part of uh, Colorado's cultural history. Um, <clears throat> Please uh, fill out the survey, and I can't end without uh, telling you how this is a team event, and I have to give thanks to a number of people that helped pull this off today. Especially, I want to point out uh, Patricia Martinez, the fearless leader of the Health Equity Learning Series team, Barb Gallegos, Tara Spar, uh, Rachel, who's helped us out quite a bit today, and the uh, DEM, our intern, who is uh, working uh, overtime for no money, and the rest of the Colorado Trust for the execution of the events, and the staff here at the center. Thanks for joining us, and uh, 
I hope the rest of your day is fantastic. Thanks.